One of the fun things about being a pastor in the 21st century is making sure that you say welcome to everyone online as well as everyone here. So good morning, everyone. <laughs> we are just so honored to have you all here in the sanctuary and to have everyone join us online today. For everyone who may be new, my name is Reverend Kevin Toth. And on behalf of Reverend Darla Goodridge, our music staff, our media staff, our elders, and our worship leaders, we are blessed by your presence as we join together to worship the living God this morning. So today is going to be a unique uh, Sunday for a variety of reasons, but first let me just share a couple of announcements before I go into detail as to why today is a little different from our usual worship services. Our next Pathfinder newsletter will be coming out this, pa uh, this coming Thursday, so please be sure to check out all the things that are going on in the life of the church when that comes out later this week. And then we would love to know that you are here worshiping with us this morning. We have an attendance pad in the Narthex area, and uh, we would just love for you to just sign your name. And everyone who is here online with us, please be sure to let us know you're here as well by either leaving a a uh, comment or a reaction on the worship feed. All right, so what's so different about the today? 
So this past week, we did have several of our choir members be exposed to the COVID-19 virus, and for that reason, we decided that it would be best if both the choir and everyone in the sanctuary not uh, sing any hymns during today's service. So, the, but the governing board, we are continuing to have uh, this conversation, and they'll be actually meeting this Tuesday to continue having this conversation on the matter. And while we do encourage everyone to continue practicing social distancing and wearing a mask while in the church building, we are still mask optional. And we just want to thank you all for your continued patience and your flexibility as we continue to manage through these, what I like to call, very complicated times. We are very excited that while we're not going to have any hymn singing today, after the message, we will be receiving a special music piece from our amazing pianist, Jay Miranda. So Jay, thank you for sharing your gifts with us this morning. I also am very excited to share that we have a guest preacher today, Reverend Sarah Reed Jay. Although I have to say the word guest is not very appropriate because she and her family have been attending our church for the last two years and officially became members of our church last year. For those who may not know, Sarah is an ordained minister in the American Baptist Church. She is a graduate from Chicago Divinity School, has served many churches in Illinois and Ohio, and along with her ministerial work, she has also done a lot of excellent and important work in child advocacy. She also currently serves as our youth education chair here at, um, at our church as well, which I cannot say we're more blessed to have you uh, help us with that work as well. And she, uh, we are so, so we're just so excited to listen to Sarah's wonderful message and for her graciously stepping into the pulpit as our senior minister, Darla Goodridge, is currently out of town in St. Louis to see her daughters graduate from college this weekend. And speaking of graduation, Today is also a unique Sunday because we will be honoring the graduates of our church and in our lives today. Vic, can you go ahead and put up the graduate slide for me? All right. So in the last several weeks, we have reached out to the congregation and we've asked you if you can send us the names of either children or grandchildren you know who are either graduated this spring or who are currently graduating this May. So we may honor them this morning. And the list is everyone we have received, that, uh, everyone on the slide is everyone we have received, but we also have this little uh, graduation sheet that gives like the details of all of our graduates, where they're graduating from, and who they are re related to in the church. And if you haven't picked one up, there's plenty over on the communion table. And if we did miss anybody, I just want to say I greatly apologize, and I just ask that you reach out to me before Tuesday, as I will be writing a... Um, article in our upcoming newsletter, and I want to make sure I include everybody's name. So if I did miss anyone, I apologize, and just let me know before Tuesday. And now, I wish to invite any graduates who may be in the sanctuary to join me in front of the communion table. I just want to say it's been such an honor and a blessing to get to know you both the two years that I have been at First Christian. So this is Harmony Taylor, and she is a graduate of Crawfordsville High School. And I just found out this. I know you and your family have been coming to our church for a, a long time, but I didn't know that Harmony has been part of our Logos and WOW program since kindergarten. Like 12 years. <laughs> And I'll even share this. I remember last year when um, I first came to the church and we were completely online and I was trying to figure out how to stay connected with our youth. And so I did the Zoom class and Harmony was like the main person who would always jump in each week. So I know she has a lot of dedication for the youth programming of our church. And Harmony will be attending Denison University and you are possibly pursuing a psychology major. And I, one thing I love about college is that even if you go in and you're like, I want to pursue this, and then, oh, wait, I want to kind of change that, there's a lot of flexibility, and so I always enjoy that. But we are just so excited for this next stage of your journey, Harmony. And this is Ian Gale. Ian, you have been attending our church the last four years, correct? And you come from Arizona, and I, th I know your family is here with us as well. And you've been part of the Wired Word uh, class, which, we, which meets every Sunday. 
And I he you have graduated from uh, Wabash College with a Bachelor of Arts in Philosophy major, correct? All right, I just want to say first to that I uh, took two philosophy courses in college, and I remember they were the hardest courses I ever took. So kudos for you for not only like for majoring in philosophy in these last four years. And you will be going to uh, France. Actually, I just found out this morning, you'll be traveling uh, like different parts of, the, of Europe and even Israel. But then this next coming year, you're going to be teaching through the TAPIF program in the Armens region in France. So, wow. That is such a wonderful accomplishment, and we're just so proud of you and so honored that you got to share these last four years with us. We graduated Magna Cougar Order as well. I did not know that. Wow. <laughs> Thank you, Raymond. Yes, that's a, such a big accomplishment, so congratulations. Well, we are just so proud of both of you. And we want to honor you both with this wonderful gift, Jesus the Savior by William Plaker. I have been told, especially by Raymond, that he is a phenomenal writer and theologian. And so we hope that these gifts will bless you as you go on to this next journey of your life. Before you do uh, go, I want to invite everyone here to stand if you are able for our call to worship. And our call to worship is going to be a little different. So we are going to bless not only our graduates here, but also all of our graduates that are in our lives with this blessing. And so I invite you to extend your hand toward the chancellor area and follow along with me with the blessing that is found on the screen. So will you join with me? We give thanks for these young graduates and celebrate their hard work and dedication in their education. May they take their knowledge, skills, and insights that they gained on the many roads ahead of them as they make the world a better place. May the love of God and the love of this community surround them and inspire them to believe in themselves in this next stage of their lives. Thanks be to God and these amazing graduates. Amen. Thank you both, and thank you all. You all may be seated. You all may. And now i like to invite all of our children and young at heart to join Miss Amber for our children's moment. They're really busy back there. Hey, guys, come on down. Come see me. Good morning. How are you this morning? Good. Good. Hi, Mr. Leo. You guys good today? All right, so I have some things in my bag. Let me get this out first. All right, I want to know, I want to know what, I want to know what, what are these? Dandelions. Oh, they're dandelions. Do you like dandelions, Leo? Yeah. yeah. Do you like these? Do you like dandelions? Have you ever picked dandelions for anyone? Who'd you pick them for? Uh, Did you pick you? them? Did you pick and them? My mommy. Oh my gosh. And so, anytime you find dandelions, you're going to pick them, right? You're going to see them and pick them. Well, um, so I teach school and I end up a lot with dandelion bouquets. Now, I'm going to give you a little secret. Do you know that this is a weed? Do you know this is a weed? Okay, this is a weed. So, this is what it starts like. Okay. Then it gets to. Hmm, wait, let me just, shall I? Okay, so then it gets to like this one, doesn't it? The one that's all white and puffy. And <clears throat> what do we do with this, usually? You do. You what do you do with it? Wish. You make, oh, I love you. You make a wish, right? And you blow it, don't you? And then sometimes mm, when it's gone, it sort of looks like this, doesn't it? So it starts out, I mean, they start out really pretty, and then they kind of end up a little bit like this. And I was thinking that kind of like in life, things start out really great, and then sometimes you make some wishes, and then sometimes this can happen. But I think it's really awesome if we take all of it and make it great. And I need you to help me. Can you stick a couple in the holes? We can even break them. Can you stick one in the holes? So we've got this flower pot. Here, Leo, help me. Make it short. I know. We can shove them in here. Does it fit? You can even shorten it down. So I have this little flower pot, and we're gonna take.
take all of them. And we can take anything. We can take weeds. We can turn them into. Will you help me, Leo? Can you stick one in there? So, so I want you to remember you that you can. That they are. That even when we know it's a weed, it can still be beautiful, and we can turn it into great things. Right? Can we turn it into something cool? Yeah. Just kind of like things with life. You get some weeds sometimes. It's all about how we look at it and how we approach it. You guys are really good at this. I'm going to put you, whoop, lost one. Can you say a prayer for me as we continue to do this? Let's say a prayer together. Ready? Dear God, we thank you for the weeds. We thank you for the flowers. And we thank you for the wishes. Because they all come from you. Amen. Thanks, guys. Can I keep this? So before we go into our morning pastoral prayer, I also I want to particularly lift up all of those in Buffalo, New York, in the recent uh, mass shooting that occurred. It breaks my heart every time whenever we hear about the violence that continues to plague our world. So I want to lift them up in prayer and all the prayers that we may carry with us into this morning together. Will you pray with me? All loving God, we give thanks for the ways that you continue to pour out your compassion into the world and into our lives. When we become distracted from any dark moment or any period in which we are just consumed by despair, help us to see where your light is continuing to shine around us. May every person who is on our hearts and minds today be touched and blessed by your comforting presence. We lift up all we know who are experiencing grief, sadness, depression, uncertainty, pain of all kinds, and hopelessness. May your peace strengthen their spirits in these trying times. We pray for all communities in the world who continue to face persecution, oppressive systems, invasion, and extreme loss. May the winds of justice and peace surround them in these trying times. Let us lift up in prayer all those who are struggling with either their physical health or their mental health or their emotional health and their spiritual health. May they experience harmony as they are embarking on their own healing journeys. Let us trust in the ways that you enter each of our lives, O God, and may you empower us to continue to do the good works of compassion, peace, justice, and love that you call each of us to do as your beloved children. We pray all these things in your name and in the name of your Son, Jesus Christ, who taught us many things, including your most sacred prayer. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our sins, as we forgive those who sin against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Good morning. 
We come together today to worship God and all that he does in our lives. We also come together to give of ourselves to do his work. Now for those at home, feel free, feel free to place your offering in an offering basket or special place. Please join me in prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you for all the blessings you give us each and every day. Please take these offerings we give today and help us to use these gifts to do your will. Amen. What would it be like to found a new church? A challenge. What about a denomination? An overwhelming obstacle, a logistical nightmare, perhaps? What about to start a new religion all together? To work out the teachings and practices from the ground up because of a burning new revelation within you that demanded you to follow? What would it be like if, to follow God like this, you had to risk everything, your faith and community relationships, even your life? This is what the book of Acts tells the story of, the founders of the church trying to figure it all out and to get it absolutely right. Everything was at stake for them. They began as a new movement within Judaism, within their home synagogues of Jesus followers. Yet their experiences of God kept urging them to rethink who they were and invite new people in, sometimes in direct conflict with what they'd always believed. In today's scripture, we hear the story of Peter explaining to his fellow Christians in Jerusalem about how he came to invite Gentiles into the church. Peter had done something radical, to put it mildly, while away on a trip. And when he got back home, he had to answer for it. He shared that God sent him a vision telling him to let go of the dietary rules that kept him from eating with Gentiles. And then, while he was visiting with Cornelius, a Roman centurion, and preaching to his household, the Spirit came and filled them, just like on the day of Pentecost. The Spirit baptized them. So what could Peter do? He baptized them as well with water. His Jerusalem friends, to their credit, when he got back home, were excited by the news, and they were ready to join in with him. So let's listen now to the reading from Acts. Acts 11, verses 1 through 18. Now the apostles and the brethren who were throughout Judea heard that the Gentiles also had reached the word of God, received the word of God. And when Peter came up to Jerusalem, those who were circumcised took issue with him, saying, you were, went to uncircumcised men and ate with them. But Peter began speaking and proceeded to explain to them in an orderly sequence, saying, I was in the city of Joppa praying, and a trance, I saw a vision, a certain object coming down like the great sheet, lowered by four corners from the sky, and it came right down to me. And when I fixed my gaze upon it and was observing it, I saw the four-footed animals of the earth and the wild beasts and the crawling creatures and the birds of the air. And also heard a voice saying to me, Arise, Peter, kill and eat. But I said, By no means, Lord, for nothing unholy or unclean has ever entered my mouth. But a voice from the heavens answered a second time, what God has cleansed, no longer consider unholy. And this appeared three times 
and everything was drawn back into the sky. And behold, at that moment, the three men appeared before the house in which we were staying, having been sent there, sent to me from Caesarea. And the Spirit told me to go with them without misgivings. And these six brethren also went with me, and we entered the man's house. And he reported to us how he had seen the angel standing in his house and saying, Send to Joppa and have Simon, who is also called Peter, brought here, and he shall speak words to you, which you will be saved, by which you will be saved, and you and your household. And as I began to speak, the Holy Spirit fell upon them, just as he did upon us at the beginning. And remembered the word of the Lord, how he said to, to, to say, he used to say, John baptized with water, but you shall be baptized with the Holy Spirit. If God, therefore, gave to them the same gift he has given to us also after believing in the Lord Jesus Christ, who was I that I could stand in God's way? And when they heard this, they quieted down and glorified God, saying, Well then, God has granted to the Gentiles also the repentance that leads to life. Thus reads the word. Will you pray with me? May the words of my mouth, the meditations of our hearts and our minds, be acceptable in your sight, O Lord, our strength and our Redeemer. Amen. We read this origin story from the comfort of being the established church. And so it may seem like an obvious and good answer to let the Gentiles in, us, right? <laughs> but to those early characters, Peter and Paul, Priscilla and James, the future was as opaque to them as ours is to us. The graduates whom we're celebrating today might feel a little bit like those apostles setting out on their adult lives full of hope and ambition and excitement, but not knowing yet where the path will lead. Do you remember those big questions and trying to discern God's voice in your own life? I remember wrestling within myself endlessly. Which school to attend, which field to study, every new step we take opens so many possibilities. These first Christians were feeling their way forward with questions and doubts, excitement, trust, leaving behind everything established, listening with all their might to the Spirit. Just imagine, they didn't have the New Testament. They had to write it. They were crossing a bridge by laying down one plank at a time. Peter told his colleagues this incredible story. He was in a prayer trance and saw a vision of a large sheet filled with animals that he'd always been told not to eat. And a voice told him to eat. And when he protested, the voice said, what God has made clean, do not call profane. It's one of those interesting details we find in biblical stories that in Peter's vision, the animals come down in a sheet. Why a sheet? Why not a wagon? Why not a box? Why not a basket? That sheet becomes this surprising sort of picnic blanket, right? Or better yet, it's a tablecloth laid with all the food that Peter can eat. As Christians who have grown up in the majority, whose customs broadly align with our wider culture, we may wonder why it was such a big deal for Peter to eat those animals. Sometimes we forget when we read the story of the first disciples that as Jewish people, they were a small minority in the Roman Empire, a small minority who was trying hard not to be absorbed or to lose their heritage and identity. The nation of Israel had been swallowed up by the Roman Empire, but the Jewish people had managed to retain their unique faith and worship precisely by staying different. 
Peter and his fellow believers didn't eat certain foods. They were circumcised, and they didn't eat with or go to the houses of those who weren't. That identity meant being set apart as God's chosen people, and letting go of this would mean the beginning of assimilation, their Jewish distinctness being rubbed into a blur with all the swirling cultures of the Greco-Roman world. We think of Peter as an important leader, yet on that day when he welcomed Cornelius into the church, he wasn't a powerful person in the world structure, letting in a marginalized person. Peter was the marginalized person, giving up cherished cultural ground in order to let in a powerful person, someone who happened to be from the occupying army. After realizing this, I can see that Peter was making a sacrifice when he changed his rules to include the wider world. The Spirit was asking something remarkable of him. From the beginning of Acts, when, Peter, when Jesus appeared and sent his followers to the ends of the earth, they had known in principle that the message was for all people. But that nitty-gritty about how you can share a community with people you can't sit at the same table with hadn't been worked out. Until Peter's vision, it was just a hypothetical welcome. It hadn't become authentic inclusion. We might be tempted to pass judgment on those early Christians for their strange to us ideas about clean and unclean that kept others out of the church. But our society and our churches have been there in our own ways. As a child, I was just a little younger than Ryan White. And growing up in the 80s during the AIDS epidemic, I remember the fears that were everywhere and the way that HIV positive people were pushed away from contact with others. I remember we were asked and wondered, would an HIV positive child be allowed to come to school? In response to that pervasive fear, in 1983, in a San Francisco hospital, there was a nurse named Cliff Morrison, who helped to create a standard of care for patients. He was concerned that because the hospital staff didn't understand how HIV was transmitted, that patients were being neglected. Food trays were left to pile up in the hallways because people were afraid to clear them. And patients were left to lie in dirty sheets because staff were afraid to touch them. So Morrison designed a new ward, which was called simply 5B. And it was run by registered nurses, and it had one very controversial rule. The nurses were not allowed to wear protective gear. Interesting on our day with masks, right? They couldn't wear gloves or masks or gowns. Morrison knew that at that time, the doctors could not cure these patients. And so what they were offering on 5B was touch. They provided the human connection that could give patients dignity and compassion at the end of their lives. Morrison went on to found units like this across the country. He endured a lot of criticism, faced a major lawsuit. But beautifully, when asked why he cared for his patients this way, Morrison credited his Catholic faith and his family values. The Spirit had asked something remarkable of him. My favorite part about reading the book of Acts is the impression I get of this dynamic between the believers and the Holy Spirit. Each time the early Christians face a decision about whether or not they can let someone in, they realize that the Holy Spirit has already been there, has already included. The Spirit has decided for them. The Spirit is blowing through the world with grace. And the believers are racing to catch up, trying to untangle the human questions, trying to untangle the logistics raised by radical grace. In my lifetime, the wider church, just like the early church, has raised that question again and again. 
Whom can we let in? In a way, it's been the story of the last half century of the Protestant churches in America. Denominations and churches have divided and united and divided again over just these questions, over these hurdles of welcome. In the churches I've attended and pastored, I've seen the exclusion and then the inclusion and then sometimes the exclusion, but ultimately I think the inclusion of many groups, people baptized as infants, interracial couples, divorced people, LGBTQ plus people, women preachers, I've been one of those kicked out the door, people from other faith traditions, free thinkers. Perhaps some of those answers seem obvious to us, maybe they don't to all of us, but at the time, these were hurdles. Yet when we chose to extend that welcome, like Peter with Cornelius, we found that the Spirit had already been there long before us, long, long, long before us. We were the ones coming late to the table. As I thought about the main idea of this story, discerning exclusion and inclusion, or changing exclusion into welcome, I found myself drawn to that image of a sheet because of the connection between soft sheets and hospitality. Important, right? Can you think of a place or home where you have stayed, where you've received really great hospitality? What made it exceptional? What made them such good welcome givers? Getting the sheets on the guest beds is an important part of my hospitality ritual when company is coming to visit. And in our house, sometimes it's an endeavor to find a whole sheet, a whole set of matching sheets that actually fit on the guest bed and is worthy of guests, right? I don't want to give them the ones with the hole by the foot, you know, the ones I would use, but I'm not going to give them to them, or those ones that I know are really scratchy. And I certainly don't want them to have a top and a bottom that are different colors because I want them to know that they have the best sheets and I want them to have the best pillows too because then they will feel comfortable and most importantly, they will feel welcome. Putting on the guest sheets is a symbol of all those little things, those extra things that we go around the house doing to get ready when people we love are coming to visit. We clear off a shelf in the bathroom, we hang fresh towels, we make sure there's a nightlight in the hallway so they don't trip and fall, and if they're arriving after dark, we make sure to leave on the porch light. These are the preparations that are part of making that other person feel that there is space for them, that they belong in your home and they're not intruding. As I thought about all of the people whom the church has struggled to welcome, starting way back with the Gentiles, and as I think about who I still have yet to welcome, maybe someone I've never imagined yet, I can't help but be confident that God is already there. God has already welcomed. God has always been there, has been giving these beloved ones the softest sheets, even matching colors for thousands of years of human history. While somehow we have gotten confused about the question that belongs to us, we get stuck asking if we should welcome when the question really is how we should welcome. What if we started to ask this new question? If instead of should we let someone in, we asked, have we made the doorway wide enough? Have we made the porch light bright enough? And are the absolute best sheets on the bed? Perhaps as Christians, we might find a grace-filled relief in discovering, like Peter, that it is not our job to deliberate about whether people are welcome, but it's simply our job to welcome them. God is the yes-sayer. If we embraced this as our joyful calling, 
Maybe the next half century in American church history could look a little different. Maybe we could be a witness to humankind about the value of all people's lives. As I read the story of Peter's vision, I kept asking myself, what is in my sheet? Instead of those animals, if God sent me a vision revealing my blind spots of welcome, what would they be? What would God say, Sarah, you need to let go of, even if it's a sacrifice, in order to include someone else? I don't know every answer to this question yet, but it's work I want to keep doing. What is in my sheet? What is in your sheet? In truth, it's a lot easier to see what's in someone else's sheet than what's in our own. That's the nature of a blind spot, I suppose. And so maybe we can help each other in this way. We can help each other to see because the Spirit is asking something remarkable of us. In closing, let us meditate on that one, the great welcome giver. For sometimes all of us need to remember that we are at all times invited by God, the source of all life and love who prepares space on the shelf for us, who makes sure the door is wide enough for all the things we are carrying, who leaves the light on for us when we are traveling through the night, who creates a place where even we belong, where we have always belonged, Thank you, O gracious one. Amen.
So as we have been talking about graduation today, it has made me reflect back upon my time at school, particularly middle and high school. And I have to admit that there's one part of school that I never really quite enjoyed because it gave me this pit of anxiety, lunchtime. I think some of y'all know, understand where I might be going with this. So every time I would go through the line, I would get my lunch, and then the dreaded question was, where am I to sit? Like, can I sit over there? But every seat seems to be filled, and the question always arose, would I be welcomed at this table? Would the people there want me to be part of their group during, when we have lunchtime? And so these questions would invade my mind every time I would go through the lunch line. And thankfully, when, we, when it comes to this table, when it comes to God's table, those questions are indeed answered, but they're answered in the affirmative. When God says to every single person, yes, I want you here. Yes, please come to this table. There is always room for you. Yes, come back each week and the next and the next and the next. That is the beauty of God's table, to be reminded that all people are so loved by God and that the invitation to join God's meal is extended to everyone, no matter what. So come, let us rejoice and partake in this holy meal with God together. Will you join with me with the words of institution? For I have received from the Lord what I also delivered to you, that the Lord Jesus, on the night he was betrayed, took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, he took the cup after supper, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink the cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Please pray with me. Dear God, as we gather once again at your table, we are thankful. We are thankful that you are with us and love us always. We are thankful that your love doesn't stop at the walls of our church or the borders of our country, but transcends the world and all of its diversity. We are forever blessed that you never give up on us and are thankful for the gift of prayer. Help us to lean on prayer more often and that we may have faith in you and ask that your will be done each and every day, for you are our sovereign Lord. And lastly, we are thankful for the sacrifice made by your Son, Jesus Christ, and this table, without which we would be lost forever. As we partake of the sacraments, may we love and trust you, love our neighbors in all the world despite our differences, and perhaps the hardest one is to love ourselves as you love us. For the table, and you're welcome to all to join around it, we are so thankful. In Jesus' name, amen.
Let us pray. This is a table of congratulations. This is a special table for our kids who, young people who have graduated and gone on to something more, more special than they've had with us before. This is a table of congratulations because we come each week with a, sense, a new sense of our love for Christ, our love for service, and we ask you to go with us from this place, guide and direct us in all we say and do, and these pray in Jesus' holy name. Amen. I want to thank pastors Kevin and Darla for the privilege to preach and, and share with you this morning and offer a blessing as we go. As we go, may God grant our graduates a well of blessings that runs deeper than any challenge. And may God grant us the grace to become ever more givers of welcome in the name of Christ Jesus our Lord. And may the Spirit never cease to ask remarkable things of us. Amen. Go in peace.